This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. I'm immensely grateful for the invitation to participate in this really exciting workshop today. And I would like to warmly thank Jill and Victoria for um, including me and for all the hospitality. Um, I was particularly intrigued and fascinated by the cross-cultural and interdisciplinary approach um, to examining these core themes and concepts such as motherhood in its various facets, migration and exile, within both a literature, literary and social science perspective. And I have very much enjoyed reading uh, both papers and um, also listening to them just now. Uh, being the last uh, respondent of a fruitful and engaging day is always a challenge, so I brought together some thoughts and reflections in a more coherent, structured manner, and um, that in order to stimulate further group discussion, so I'm not going to be speaking for uh, much longer than um, about five, ten minutes. Egla's paper entitled Mothering in a Foreign Language, Silent and or Multilingual Mothers focuses on a silent mother, the main character and by extension the author of the literary nonfiction text, The Mother Silence by the Lithuanian-born essayist, translator and academic Dalia Stabenkute. The silent mother is silenced, ironically, by motherhood. <coughs> And this estrangement is compounded by a doubling of exile. The exilic migrant mother is silenced by the very act of mobility. And thus, this voluntary act of migration, instead of an agentic movement, becomes an experience of disempowerment. Such disempowerment and estrangement extends beyond her children as the mother's linguistic silencing becomes a source of trauma and alienation from herself. Her children are the offspring of a cross-cultural relationship between a Lithuanian and a Greek Cypriot. Born and raised in Cyprus, we can only assume that the children are immersed in the Greek language and their everyday lives in their social and educational interactions. Since the mother speaks no Greek, her silence is translated into passivity, loneliness, disempowerment, boredom, self-containment, emotional impotence, and inevitably death, as she experiences a continuous sense of, quote, permafrost and piercing nostalgia, end quote. The author's experience resonates with the feeling of how the embodiment of pain seeps through one's sense of self. Yet, I might add, the description is quite reminiscent of childbirth and its biological manifestation, but also mothering in its socializing context. Where from my personal research on the Greek diasporic context, a mother becomes the epitome of sacrifice and personal loss. And in the case of most of my participants in my studies, further being shaped by the trauma of working class lives, as well as a multitude of exclusions and racisms encountered in the diaspora. So excruciating pain becomes indeed the very validation of life, that is birth. And so Eglis insightfully makes a particular clearly and strong theoretical correlation here with Christopher's work on the notion of semiotic aura in relation to Lithuanian history. However, and again interestingly with my research synthetically, it also resonates with Cypriot history Cyprus, a divided island where pain and the deep historical wounds of memory and trauma 
of separation are historically evident. And simultaneously, the need for reconciliation. Thus, the cross-cultural Greek-Lithuanian relationship ironically but clearly evidently becomes one of mirroring life in a divided island. Everyday life of migrancy, everyday life of division, memory, trauma, and hopefully, eventually, reconciliation. So language and migration are often intertwined as they shape linguistic and cultural identities. And they have immensely profound effects on motherhood. This is precisely the topic of Anna's paper, entitled The Effects of Migration on Motherhood, a Focus on Linguistic and Cultural Identities. Anna's work is situated within the field of sociolinguistics, as she examines the relationship between language and society. This particular paper is based on her research on Brazilian mothers married to men of other nationalities who are raising their children in London. And think about urban space, London is a global city space, and think about migration within the context of, of evolving and changing identities within London. This paper is based on the data collected through interviews with 13 participant mothers. Here language is perceived as a means to resistance, as a symbolic marker of representation, identity, and belonging. Mothers assume the role of language maintenance, and so in a double role of biological producers of the nation, they also nurture resistance to any other language, intend to, in inverted commas, foreignize offspring and their linguistic and cultural identities. So the mother tongue, in inverted commas, is thus the emotional language of belonging and therefore a semiotic signifier of such nurturing, as opposed to using the alternative in inverted commas, native language. Hence, Brazilianness is exemplified through the linguistic consumption of belonging to the nation. Participant narrative excerpts powerfully reflect the emotional force of linguistic identities. And I quote, I can show my emotions when I speak Portuguese, Raimunda asserts, end quote. While as a marker of identity, Lindalva underscores, quote, you are not Brazilian if you cannot speak Portuguese. It does not make sense for the mother to speak Portuguese and the children not, end quote. Hence, the, as the author notes, not only is native language speaking a necessary means to actualizing a sense of cultural identity, it becomes an essential and perhaps an essentializing component for both mother and child's emotional well-being to be able to communicate in the native language. So language accordingly becomes the vehicle for emotional well-being and socialization. So in conclusion, both papers, in complementary and at times antithetical angles, have underlined how language is power and empowerment, liberation and constraint, well-being and trauma, loss and development. So hence, through the dichotomies, we see how identities are fluid, negotiated, articulated, and constructed through the ethnos and a sense of self. Both papers were very much enjoyable to read and greatly pertinent to the scope of the research network. The papers have illuminated many interesting aspects of motherhood, migration, mothering, and exile, while responding to several of the research questions posed by the workshop conveners. 
Thank you very much, and I look forward to the collective reflection and discussion on these themes. Thank you.